Hey, sorry, that was a little bit choppy, but you did a little uh, bit of background. Was that the question? Exactly. Okay, perfect. Uh, so the TLDR uh, is I graduated school in 2007, and I, I moved to Vietnam shortly afterwards. It was uh, my parents are both Vietnamese refugees to North America, and uh, very, very confused by me returning to a country that tried really hard to leave. Uh, but uh, in Vietnam, I kind of did two things, which uh, ended up to where I am now. On the one track is, I didn't really have a plan when I got there, but I ended up doing my CFA, working in investments. I also sold a, a film script uh, to, to Fox. It was a comedy film. And basically, ever since then, I've been trying to uh, be involved in a, a business, tech, and, 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 and comedy in some capacity. So the stuff that you mentioned me being an idiot on the internet, uh, namely Twitter. That's basically a combination of uh, the, the seeds that were planted uh, in Vietnam. But uh, between uh, my time in Vietnam and now, I spent um, uh, five years in Boston working for a fintech startup uh, called Kensho. I was acquired by S&P Global in 2018. Uh, and then shortly after that, there's the slight I, uh, joined the hustle a business and tech newsletter i was there for yeah so uh, yeah that, that, that's just the kind of thing that me to where i am now cool yes, man well that's a really interesting background hearing that you know yeah, yeah yeah we can hear you can you hear us i can hear him um hopefully you're able to hear me drunk i thought that was a super interesting background i didn't know about the vietnam part and writing a script, selling it to Fox. Sounds like there was a lot of background and then where this Twitter account's coming from. What about on the weekly basis? You now have a podcast, right? I hope he can hear me because he's awesome and I'd love to be able to hear from him. All right, I will shoot him a DM. But in the meantime, while we're making sure that everything's working on his end, let's pull yourself into this, Brennan. Uh, similar type question just to start out with. Uh, Oh, well, I'm kind of hearing bits and pieces from him. Um, but similar type question just to start out with, a little bit of background, kind of how you got to this point. Sure, man. Uh, and I think Trung might have AT&T service, if I were to guess. So that might be why he's not he's not connected with us. But uh, a little background on myself is, you know, uh, I'm 30 years old now. Um, back when I was 22, I graduated from the University of Louisville. And I pursued public accounting. So I was an accounting and finance degree. And I went into work at Deloitte uh, um, Jack and, and in the audit are function. Jack and more involved in kind of Web3 and crypto than myself. Uh, so I get to learn. Every <laughs> sorry. Sorry, Brennan. Yeah, you're good. You're good. Uh, it's a little bit of a delay. Tron, can you hear us? I did shoot him a couple of DMs just to kind of <laughs> let him know what's going on. That's all good. All good. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'm going to give it just one more second. Okay. looks like he muted now for a second. So hopefully he's either seeing my text or something. So back to you, Brennan. Sure. Sure. So at about 23 years old, my wife and I came to this realization that we had quite a bit of debt on our hands and it really catapulted us into what is today is known as budget dog. And so, you know, at 23 years old, I was sick and tired of the position that we put ourselves in. And we kind of lived that you know, everyday American life that, you know, you go to, you go to college, you get a great degree, which we did. Um, but it came with a ton of debt and also, you know, having a, uh, new cars and wedding rings and traveling and all these things just added up really fast. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. And at 23 years old, I remember specifically pacing around my living room, talking to my wife and saying, we need to do something about this, like ASAP. Like, I don't want to live like this. I, I don't want to feel strapped. And I want to have a good long-term life where we can be involved with our children and money is not an issue. And so we went very hard for the next, you know, couple years, five years in, in totality. But during that process, when we were paying off all this debt, we paid off our, you know, $76,000 of debt in one year, um, non-mortgage debt. We paid off our entire mortgage in five years. I mean, we were just crushing paying off debt. And during that, I realized I was putting systems in place to, to help ourselves and I knew it could help others. And so I started doing that with my family and friends who, you know, reached out and knew, knew what we were going through. And so it really started helping them. And I said, how can I reach a broader audience? And so I went to social media, of course, and I started talking about our, our story and it caught on um, 
fairly fast. You know, the first 16 months were a little slow, but eventually it started catching on once I started sharing our story versus just talking about finance in general. Like actually being the person behind the account and not just posting, you know, statistical data on the market, like actually telling people what we're going through and how we're accomplishing this. And so I was a CPA at Deloitte at the time and I was working my way up to audit manager, um, which I eventually left. And, you know, I took, I took a deep heart, you know, hard, deep look and, into what I really wanted out of life. And I realized with everything I had going on, you know, I had this successful career, everyone said, of course, but like, it wasn't really success to me. Like just being a manager, just working my way to partner um, in a CPA firm wasn't really successful to me. Like it was sure it was a good job and paid well and stuff, but like it didn't really bring success. And I realized what success was, was being able to lend a hand out to thousands, maybe millions of people eventually, um, in the finance space to make them feel comfortable about their finances. And that's what I started doing with Budge Dog. So I basically walked away from a nine to five job and that took a lot of courage and a lot of guts that I didn't, I, I learned a lot in that process. Let's just say that. Um, it wasn't something I ever was anticipating doing. Um, people often talk about, you know, where you grow up and, and the beliefs that are given to you, it's tough to break out of that. And the beliefs, you know, it wasn't like I, I grew up in an awful area, but but the thing is that middle class area um, or socioeconomic um, arena really believes that, you know, college is the way and the only way and you have to be successful going that way. And so that was like ingrained in my mind. And so for me to walk away six years into my career, right when I started kind of taking off was a massive adjustment. And it was a, it was a shock to many people, you know, around me, um, they, you know, mainly my parents are like, what are you doing? Like you're online and all this kind of stuff, but um, you know, shortly after, it's been it's been a tremendous experience. It's been a blessing of where I'm in where, the position I'm in today. Um, just being able to help you guys listening in on a, on a daily basis. So that's really the story of Budget Dog. That's where it came about. Um, people ask me about where the Budget Dog name came from a lot. It was actually when I first started my account. I did it as a hobby, and it was actually literally my dog's face. Um, so that's literally where the uh, uh, name came from we meshed budget and dogs and literally just came together like that and um, that's where I'm at today so I'm looking forward to talking more about the millionaire mindset today and getting to know a lot more of you guys love it man so I, I think it's a super interesting story and I kind of seen you you know at the job leave the job uh, and to, to the point where you are now I uh, want to continue this back and forth now we've gotten a little bit of introduction and also see if I see Trung kind of joining and rejoining. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you guys. Uh, the, the warning, the advanced apology looks like it was worth it. Yeah, no, it's a good thing you got the disclaimer out there, you know. Uh, <laughs> sure I, ha I have uh, no idea how much you guys caught, but uh, uh, I can jump back in now and happy to listen uh, and answer any questions. Yeah. Yeah, we caught your full intro um, regarding, you know, Vietnam as well as, uh, kind of how you came up with the idea for the Twitter. I'm curious, a uh, couple of questions. You know, you really get to pick a lot of really smart people's brains. You have a lot of people on either your podcast, um, you write threads. Uh, what's the process for, you know, connecting with these people? Are there certain type of people that you like to have on? And then uh, maybe if you just want to walk through a little bit of what you've learned by having this opportunity to speak with and write about so many people who have inspired others. No, absolutely. I think... Uh, not to sound cliche, I, I've heard this a lot in other spaces, but, you know, Twitter is a great place uh, for networking when you do it correctly. It can, all the all the negative stuff people say about Twitter, you know, it's toxic, there's a lot of trolls, a lot of bullying. I mean, yeah, that, that happens. It happens on every social network. Uh, Twitter's done a lot to address those things. But the part that uh, I often bring up is just the fact, especially for the industries I'm kind of interested in, uh, journalism, uh, media, tech and finance, You'll get the top people in those industries, uh, the pretty regular users of uh, Twitter, which makes a lot of sense because Twitter's an interest, gra uh, interest graph. So, you know, they're going there to learn and, and stay on top of their respective fields. Uh, compare that to maybe a, uh, an Instagram or LinkedIn. Those are very, very different kind of graphs. Uh, Facebook's obviously a social graph. Uh, uh, LinkedIn's more of a professional graph. It's supposed to kind of be the networking tool that Twitter ended up being. But if you find people that are interested in the things that you do and you have something to contribute, and you're not overly thirsty and, and, you, and you're kind of doing it the right way, uh, being on Twitter, um, you know, it's a great way to meet those individuals. Like to answer your question directly is uh, uh, a lot of people I meet is just straight. They'll, 
kind of follow you for a bit and then they'll hit you in the DMs or vice versa and you just have, uh, you know, conversations uh, with people you otherwise would not have been able to meet on other platforms strictly because of the interest graph nature of it. Yeah, that's a great point. It absolutely is a very top level networking opportunity and, you know, hence this, right, this conversation we have right here. Absolutely. Um, you know, is a great, yeah. And so walk me through a little bit of, let's talk millionaire mindset. Um, I know that you've spoken with people. I think you've spoken with, you know, Pomp and a bunch of others. I, I, I have, have not spoken been... to Pomp. I have not. So... Not Pomp yet? <laughs> no. Okay. Is that is that in the works? Uh, I, not, not that I know of. <laughs> okay. Okay. No worries. I, I have seen several others, though. I've watched some episodes um, of, you know, Nia Podcast and things that, are, you know, you're working on there. Through that, I'm curious, you know, the idea for this was Millionaire Mindset, but I just know that you kind of write a lot that helps people find sometimes their path towards whether it's what they want to do, whether it's how to make money, whether it's whatever area it is. And I was curious if you could share some of what you've learned, you know, during this journey through the pod, from talking to people, through writing these threads, maybe some of the themes that you think uh, people get the most out of and what has been helping them, you know, build their mindset in these areas. So full disclosure, I thought this uh, Twitter space was called Thousandaire Mindset, which is perfect for me. And that's why I kind of jumped on it. But now that you've upgraded to millionaire, I'm going to have to uh, actually bring some fire. No, but I think uh, – so the people that I do meet a lot on Twitter spaces um, and uh, kind of what I mentioned about the interest graph approach is, you know, you do have to be pretty consistent with the type of content you want to put together and how you package it and what you actually think you can deliver for people. And when you say millionaire mindset, I, I don't I – don't, you know what that means all i know is that the people that are really successful uh in this chosen kind of uh, sliver that we're looking at maybe thin twit if you want to just call it that um there is uh, you know consistency is kind of the main thing i think uh i i told somebody this recently that was kind of starting their journey on twitter and building an audience and um i basically said no matter what part you are on you're gonna have some type of anxiety right like when you first start and you have less than 100 followers you're worried that no one's gonna read your tweet right but then you have 100,000 followers or more, you're worried if you tweet something, you're going to offend someone. So no matter where you are in your kind of like journey, there's going to be some type of anxiety and you need to deal with that uh, to be consistent. And and consistency is kind of, if, if, if you're going to force me to put a word to quote unquote the millionaire mindset, it's just, it's just the consistency because dealing with that anxiety that comes from literally both sides, right? It's like, you don't, you're worried that nobody's going to see it and you're worried that somebody's going to see it. The entire spectrum, some point is going to get hit. Uh, you're going to get hit with it, no matter where you're at uh, as you're creating content. And uh, if you can kind of get through that and just keep on doing it and consistently making good stuff, uh, that's kind of where, for me, the most successful people I've seen in the in the space are. Okay, yeah, definitely great points. And then before I pull it over uh, to Brennan for you know similar thoughts on the money mindset side, and I like that thousand air joke there. Um, within Twitter itself. Where are, where are your thoughts coming from that are inspiring these regularity of threads? And I'm curious, you know, for some people, a millionaire mindset is building themselves an audience, right? And clearly you've kind of mastered the idea of continuously building, putting out content people are interested in. Can you explain a little bit of the thought process and what goes behind your brand and your creations and what you're doing out there? Because I think that that is part of a millionaire mindset. Yeah, I mean, really my, the goal oh. of my content Oh, Brett, it's a, just a trunk first, and I was going to throw that to you, if, that, if that's okay. Sorry. I might might have bleaked out for a second. When I yeah, no, I, I can't be super quick. Uh, just, uh, again, I don't think this is specific to, quote, unquote, the millionaire mindset. It, it goes back to the consistency kind of angle. It's in the sense that I would have been doing this anyways. That's what I was doing anyways before I just got really active on Twitter, which I did in the past uh, basically 18 months. But I was reading three, four hours a day uh, going through the – newsletter circuit, reading the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, New York Times, pretty standard circuit. It's part of my daily job. It's really part of my job with the hustle uh, when I had to put out a daily 1.5 million readers um, five days a week. So I had to really be on top of that news cycle, but I was kind of doing that anyways. And now I write uh, a weekly column for uh, Bloomberg. I write the threads. I write my own newsletter. Same thing. I was going to do it anyways, the reading angle. Uh, what the writing forces me to do uh, it's, it's particularly in the last two years is uh, I got to spend more time um, putting in the effort of the writing muscle, which is great because you, you learn everything uh, by factor of 10 from just reading it. 
And uh, if you can, again, keep that consistency. I'm writing 90 minutes, two hours every single day. So that's the muscle I'm working. And I would have been doing it anyways. Um, but the content creation uh, forces a little bit more discipline on it. Where, where are the ideas coming from? Yeah, literally just, a, yeah, it's just uh, the daily reading. Um, Elon actually has a great perspective on uh, knowledge development. He calls it like, basically, you have to form a tree trunk of just basic knowledge across every field, right? Like, whether that's science, physics, math, uh, pop culture, uh, finance, um, media, you need to kind of understand the core of those things, which just comes from reading, 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 reading. And then you can start adding all these different branches. And, and to answer your question for like where all these ideas come from, it's just like, it's basically just like 15 years of compounded uh, or 20 years of compounded reading. So like if I see something that uh, is, is, is broadly interesting, it links back to something I read before, I'm going to follow that the rabbit hole down. And uh, that's often how I end up with my threads is like the little, little small thing I read that was not directly related to uh, a piece, uh, a thread that I'll put out, but uh, I remember the interesting part of that particular uh, story, and then go down a thread. Um, I'll just give one example. Eight days ago, I did a thread about why Doritos are so addictive. I literally just read somebody's uh, sentence in an article. They're like, "Oh, by the way, Doritos engineers their chips." I'm like, "Oh yeah, I kind of remember that." And then I looked at all the notes that I'd taken years ago about uh, random Dorito uh, addictiveness, and sure enough, uh, it was a pretty popular thread. Yeah, I actually read through that thread, found that one pretty interesting. Um, so one so one question on that is, you mentioned compounded reading there, which I find to be a very interesting term. Do you think, so most people nowadays, in my opinion, I think a lot of people, especially my age, I'm in my 20s, people are reading a lot less than they used to. And that's partially to do with, you know, so much video and smart devices. Do you think that there is a noticeable, is there a lot to gain by perhaps, you know, reading through Twitter and reading through news sites versus reading books and longer form content versus could people also be gaining a lot of this from videos and podcasts? I'm kind of just wondering from your mindset, does it all kind of compound or is there something specific within reading of maybe long form content or educational articles that really hits home? Well, I think the one thing I put out there for reading is uh, you're a lot less likely to be distracted. If you're if you're consuming information via YouTube, podcast, uh, Twitter, it's just the, the, the surface area of a distraction is so much bigger, right? Particularly if you're doing it on your phone, which I'm, uh, I'm guessing the majority of people do for this type of stuff. Um, audio is pretty high bandwidth. I know some people that can just absolutely consume audio. I don't know the retention on it. I just, reading, reading to me, especially long form reading, uh, a, a way from your phone i mean especially from a book right this forces you to sit down and read for now I'm, i mean i'll be honest with you i'm losing a lot of that muscle just because of the nature of uh, uh how i'm using my phone now and i try to keep like like i have kindle app on my phone but if i'm reading kindle on my phone i'm literally taking a break every two minutes to look at twitter it's pathetic um but if you're reading a physical book you're really just sitting down and you're forcing yourself to think and it goes back to the tree trunk stuff if you're sitting down for a, like an honest 45 hour uh long read you're just thinking, your brain's thinking, it's making these random connection uh, because it's not being distracted. But if you're flipping in between apps, which I 100% do all the time while I'm on my phone, um, I don't think you're getting that benefit. So to answer your question, I think long form reading, uh, particularly with the physical on a, on a book, it's a totally, a totally different, uh, orders of magnitude different of learning uh, potential. That's a really good point there. I didn't think about the distractions that people get from reading on an electronic device, right? The notifications, everything that comes in. Great points. Great points, Strong. Okay. Uh, I want to bring Brennan back into this real quick before uh, we'll keep it popping. And also, Evan, if you have any questions, start brewing because I'm going to come to you. Brennan, walk me through your process with creating your content, uh, what the messages you're trying to get out there. And then also, I know that you kind of also kind of coach people a little bit. How does that work with cultivating that millionaire mindset? Yeah, absolutely. So most of my content is honestly relatable. And what I what I say what I mean by that is there's a lot of stuff on FinTwit and just in general on social media that's like way over most people's heads or to like the point zero zero one percent of people. I'm trying to put out content that you know anybody and everybody will come across and actually probably experience in their lifetime financially and actually benefit from. So 
some of that stuff comes from directly, you know, my personal situation, things I actually go through and have actually done myself. Some of that comes from other clients that I've had or people that I've heard, you know, friends, family, some experience they went through. Um, and a lot of reading. I, I think what Trung was saying about the reading piece of it, I, I read a lot. Um, now, I listen to a lot also. So, like, the distraction piece of it that we were talking about a second ago, um, really what I try to do is if I'm listening to, like, a, a Audible book or a podcast, I actually put my phone down and put my headphones in and walk away. I could be cleaning the house. I could be going on a walk. But I will not actually look at my phone, so there are no distractions, and I get a lot of actual information out of that. So most of my stuff is stuff that I know people are going to deal with. Obviously, so my my background as a CPA in the audit field um, and just in, in my industry, I, I've come across a lot of people um, that have had similar financial situations or some, you know, the typical personal things. I also have a lot of fr friends that are actually financial advisors, and we just have conversations. And a lot of times during those conversations, I find out what's the what's the common, like, trend that I hear the issues that people are having how do I fix that how do I provide a solution to those common issues and I put out my content and there's a lot of inspiration behind that stuff and again I think a, the, a big piece of this is constantly staying up to date with you know latest tax laws latest um, financial news stuff like that but also how can it actually help somebody that's actually just reading it and and, and also I think a, a big piece of this is dumbing not and this is not to me seem like you know arrogant but you know dumbing this down making it simple um that is key to anybody out there trying to pr present information um i know you know the average the pr presidential speeches are on average level of like a third grader or fourth grader don't quote me on that but it's something along the lines of that if you can't present something and get someone's attention because it's too high level they're going to zone out and they're going to go to the next next thread that's easier to understand so i always try to make sure it's very simple um, I like to use analogies so that people really can pick up and grasp the concepts. And when I do that, I think it connects with a lot of people. And that's really where my inspiration comes from. Great point there with the relatability and how they don't, you know, scroll past it because you can kind of keep it super simple. And a lot of the times that's with money, right? Because money's a super relatable thing. I kind of see that as a, as a current theme, right? Absolutely. Um, and, and the thing is, if you can't explain it to a fifth grader, you know, a five-year-old or whatever they say, you probably don't understand it as well. And I think as a teacher myself, I've, I've come to realize sometimes I teach myself during like putting these threads together, putting, I'm like, oh, that makes a lot more sense now. The way I, I frame it like this versus how it was framed before. I think that really helps myself learn. Um, so I think like people out there trying to teach others, like you'll teach yourself in the, in the process, which is really cool. Very, very interesting. I like that a lot. Um, okay, bouncing back to you, Trung, uh, for a question in stock market news, I want to see if you have some ones that you want to throw out here. Uh, you've written, I don't know, hundreds of threads, thousands of threads. What are, what, what are you know, besides obviously getting like a lot of likes and retweets, what are some of your favorite types of threads to write and why? And do those kind of coincide with the ones that perform the best? Um, let me think, actually. The, my favorite thread I did was one about ASML. Uh, they make the machines that make semiconductors. And the reason why I personally enjoyed making that was there's actually something specific to Twitter um, that not a lot of people actually use the thread format for. But let's say you have a thread that's all text, right? That when people say, oh, that could have been a blog post, that is true. It, it definitely could have been a blog post or... Uh, you know, the, the, the reading it on online or within an, an email newsletter is not that different than actually reading it through via Twitter thread. But the embedding of videos and GIFs or GIFs, I believe it's pronounced, is, uh, is reading it in a Twitter thread is much different than kind of scrolling through a, uh, a, a website or in your email inbox, especially because email inbox, you can't do the, the video. So the one I'm referencing uh, that I really enjoyed the ASML ones because it's embedded with videos and, and, and GIFs. So I basically condensed like 20 hours of research into something that was three to five minutes for somebody to read. And they could understand broad, the broad strokes of why this company ASML is literally one of the 10 most important companies in the world. So 
to answer your you know your top level question, is there something about the thread format or is there a, a thread that I particularly like? It's, a, it's the explainers where you can actually bring in uh, video and, and GIFs that otherwise would not be typically used, uh, you know, in, maybe in a an email newsletter because you can't with the video or sometimes you're reading on, on the web page. It's just not the same as within the mobile reading through a thread where video and, and the GIFs are just so native to, to fingering through a thread. Very interesting. Okay. Um, one other one on there. You are now, you know, years into building this account. You're over 300,000 followers. You're now writing for Bloomberg, other opinions. Uh, I think, you know, part of what makes up a great millionaire mindset is the forward looking, right? It's continuing to say, okay, what comes next? Where am I building upon this? So, you know, I, I, I'm interested for yourself uh, a little bit on your mind process of, you know, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening. What am I doing next? How do you build out your regiment, your schedule, and kind of like plan for the future? And I want to kind of put it in a way that maybe people in the audience can draw from that into their own lives. Um, yeah, I, I apologize in advance if there's nothing like an aha moment here. And no, you're, you're totally like, good. If, I, if I'm doubling down we, on the we, we, cliche, let's just say Let's just tell the audience, we didn't plan any of this in advance. I'm throwing yeah. random off-the-cuff no, questions no, at totally. you. And we're, we're, we're chilling. No, no, I... Um, It'll go back to consistency thing. And what I mean by that is this. You're asking me what do I think it's going to look like in the future. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I do zero planning, man. It's like zero. I do less than zero planning. All I know is this. I'm going to be, as I mentioned, reading three to four hours a day. And now I'll be creating content around that. So I know what I'm doing five hours every single day. And that's what I want to be doing. So no matter what I'm doing in the future, it will involve those uh, th that framework of my day, right? So it, it's very simple. Like I've chosen what I wanted to do, and now different opportunities will come. Uh, as we mentioned from the top, like the networking uh, aspect, or you're kind of putting content out there, and it becomes a, a, a lighthouse for people that are attracted to that particular type of content. The opportunities will come, but my day is not going to change. That's what I know. I'm going to do the exact same thing. That's what I will optimize for, and that's what makes me the happiest, and that's what makes me the most productive. So. Uh, to answer your broader question of like, what does the future look like? Is like, honestly, day to day, it'll be more the same, maybe on a different scale, maybe a different distribution channel, but it will be the same. Perfect. Stock market news. Got any questions brewing up there? Yeah, always got a couple brewing. First one that kind of I've been thinking about uh, a lot about is like, Trunk, what gets you excited on, on Twitter these days? Is it uh, a post going viral? Is it that huge new connection you can make or? or whatever it is, is there something specific in there that you see that it still gets you the most excited on here? I mean, I'd be lying if I didn't say that it was a complete dopamine drip machine and I'm probably addicted to it. I mean, that's just the truth. Um, there is, uh, and, and let's be honest, these, these companies, uh, all the social networks, they have hundreds of the best uh, minds in the world, the data scientists, ML engineers, to keep you addicted to their product. And uh, so that's that's part of it. The fact is, uh, Twitter is a video game in a lot of ways. It's, to me, it's no different than Fortnite. You're get the dopamine hits you get from you know getting engagement is probably similar to what you're getting if you're really good at Fortnite. And uh, in Fortnite, you have different maps, and every day there's some trending news that's a different map that you're playing on Twitter. And like, I'm gonna try to make a funny meme that gets engagement if there's a new story, right? Like there's a, there's a wealth tax that came out today. I'm probably going to do some meme about it later today, and I hope that it gets a lot of engagement. That's just the psychology of the dopamine drip. So that's uh, that's part of it. Um, the other part is, uh, and I mentioned earlier, it keeps me honest. Um, the it, it forces me not to just be the consumer side. It, it forces me to do the work uh, and, and and try to deliver something for people that are following me and do want to read stuff and do want to learn. So uh, those are the two parts of it. It's just the straight cynical, it's a dopamine machine. And the other part is uh, I want to learn myself and having an audience, of course, keeps me honest on that front uh, that I have to deliver quality and do it consistently. Does it ever become like stressful for you in having to make that poster every single day? I, I kind of imagine with the three, four hours of reading, you can pretty much find something easily every single day. It kind of comes to you. But there, is there ever that time where it is a little bit stressful to find stuff? And have you ever, like, do you, what do you do there? Do you have stuff kind of on backup? Or is it just like, hey, 
I'm my own boss. I, we don't got to post today. You know, consistency is the number one thing, but one day off will kill you. Um, I wouldn't say the – not necessarily stress of not having enough content. I'm actually kind of the other way. Is like I need to take a break. Like I do want to take breaks because I know fully how unhealthy it is to be on that dopamine drip. Because um, it really does – I mean, you, you notice it. Like be, before I used Twitter – I was meditating like 20, 30 minutes a day. Now I just, I'm kind of lacking that discipline now. And and I know it's affecting my life in frankly negative ways. You know, I have a kid, I have a toddler. I'm sometimes less patient than I want to be. And I'm not going to blame Twitter for that, but you you have, because of that dopamine connection, Like I, I just can't talk about it enough because it's, uh, I'm watching my mind go through it, right? Um I'm kind of on the other side of it. I'm not worried. I'm not stressed about not having enough. It's more like I need to pull back. And because, frankly, let's be honest, nobody will give a shit if I don't post for a day. Like, nobody cares, right? Like, that's the other thing about it. It's like, you have to be consistent. But the, also the reality is that people spend 99.9% .9 of their life caring about themselves. They, they don't, they're just not really going to care at the end of the day if you're not posting, right? Like, I'm not, I'm not narcissistic enough to think that people care if Chung doesn't post that day. So... That's the other part. Of it. I, I say I'm on the complete other side of that coin, where like I'm worried, not necessarily not having never but I don't. I, I need to have more of a break. Hey, I, I struggle with that too. I need one of those apps that like kind of blocks me off Twitter, everything for a day, every once in a while. Absolutely. Hey, Brandon, I kind of like this discussion right here of habits. I guess that maybe we lost because of Twitter, but ones that we can build. Um, and I want to bring you back into this afterwards, Trunk. So, Brennan, what are some of the habits uh, that you think build up a millionaire mindset or just people that are successful? Yeah, there's. this is a long list, guys. I think number one, first and foremost, is good energy. Um, positivity. And that doesn't – I'm not trying to get cliche or like, you know, you know, the typical answers, but it really does. Like when you – it's been it's been proven if you're smiling during the day, people are more attracted to you. More people will come up and talk to you for whatever reason. You're going to get more opportunities because of that, and networking is going to expand as a result. And you know you're you're constantly going to be getting uh, good feedback. Whatever you put out is going to come back to you. So I, I do truly believe in that um, to a certain extent with with the good energy. I I, I see that everywhere. All of the most you know people out there are typically ones that possess good energy so um that's you know first and foremost i think another one is being able to be firm in your beliefs and, and where you stand on things but also realizing you don't know everything and you're never going to know everything um so not being over the top naive or gullible and falling for every little trap that pe people put out there but i do think it's it's smart to at least listen and hear the other side of the story um from either people with experience, wisdom, you know, they've been around for quite some time or, or what, what not, maybe just somebody random that has something to say. Um, I, I always like to take in that information. Now, whether I always am going to be like, yeah, definitely that's right or wrong. At least you're putting it through your brain and processing it. I think that's really, really smart thing to do. Um, and that's a habit I've tried to form myself. Um, another thing is from a, like a physical standpoint, I like to be, I'm very regimented always have been. So this transition from nine to five to self-employed was a huge, like shock to me, like to just my body and everything. Like I was used to getting up at 5 a.m., working out, um, packing my lunch, packing my clothes for the, uh, for work like, after the gym, um, packing everything and like having everything scheduled down to a block. And now as a self-employed person, I am a stay at home dad. So I'm actually staying home with my daughter, uh, full time. And she's only seven months and you guys might be able to hear her in the background <laughs> screaming here soon, but it's a lot different. Like I have to be up ready and I have to, uh, you know, schedule my day accordingly because things are going to go awry. And, and that's something I'm trying to get used to. I, I'm, I'm so used to just, Hey, I'm going to go here at this time, here at this time, here at this time. And with a daughter, seven months old, things are changing. Um, so I recently got a whiteboard and I write on that thing every single day, all my thoughts, all my, my schedule, my hourly blocks, but I also give myself some wiggle room and say, okay, well, you know what? If things don't play out exactly to this whiteboard today and I get, you know, 60 or this 60% done, I'm probably doing something right. And so I always think of it that way, like plan your day, but be, you know, be agile, make sure that you're able to um, be nimble and, you know, think on your toes as, as the day, you know, presents more information. Um, having mentors is a, is a big one, obviously finding somebody that is where you, not necessarily, 
just has some cool things going on. Like, what do you actually want personally? Ask yourself, what do I want? Do I want to pay off a lot of debt? Do I want to have be a deck a millionaire? Do I want to do, you know, have 10 real estate properties? Like, what do you want to do yourself? And then go find somebody that's actually done that. Not somebody that's just talking about it theoretically or, you know, a professor that talks about through a textbook, like somebody that's actually done what you tr you're trying to do. I think seeking out mentors like that in a practical sense is one of the most beneficial things you can do and really going up under their wing and asking them for help. Don't be afraid. Ask the question. I, you know, I get turned down all the time when I ask questions. No, 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 no. You know, business proposals, but I'll keep asking because I know that 1%, whether that sounds cliche or not either, like it actually works because that one, with that 1% 1 that say yes, well, I just got a business opportunity or the extra mentor that's going to help me get from point A to point B of what I'm trying to accomplish here. So those things are big. And then consistency, like, Evan, like I said, like every, it, I hear him. Yeah. I've heard everything. You guys hear me? Yeah. You're good, Brendan. Sorry. You're, you're and good. So Brendan. I think, okay. I think the last thing is just that consistency aspect. Like one thing I, I do not ever like skip is the gym because I know every single day, if I get my mo if I get my body up and running, my mind will adapt and I'll, I'll be better as a result. So if I'm if I know I'm going to get into the gym that day and I feel you know like I've energized my body and I, I really give myself a good workout, everything else seems easier for after that after that. So I always like to be very consistent, you know, eating healthy, going to the gym, those kind of physical things, and I think that translates into um, having success outside of the physical realm into the mental space. And I, I see. It's worked for me. I've been going consistently for about 16 – since I was 16, I'm now 30, 30 years old. So um, let's just say 14 years of consistency, and I've seen a lot of compounded results with time kind of play out. I like it. Definitely the consistency. I think it was a great point off the bat, just the positivity. Um, you know, people say it a lot of times, but the most important choice you make every day is to be happy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that, absolutely that, that, that is just where where it all starts you know you wake up and so much of it's a mental game and the mental game plays into everything that you do and there's obviously a lot of books and people that can talk on this but i completely agree with you on that Whew. deep stuff man i like it um i want to throw the same question to trunk uh i assume you may have probably written a thread that went viral on this um any any you know also if you want to add on to anything that brennan said anything that stood out to you there but uh, what are some of the habits that you've seen of successful people, um, maybe wealthy people? Obviously, those two things could be completely different. Um, if there's anything that stood out different than what Brendan was talking about, or if you want to bounce off any of his points. No, I, uh, I think those were great points. I, I like the whiteboard. That's a great call. And, uh, you know, with the with the toddler myself, I totally get it, man. If you can, <laughs> if you can get 60% of that done, that's pretty amazing. Uh, the one thing I will say about the kid is uh, – uh, uh, to jump on the earlier point was they, you know, you think you want X, Y, Z and you think you want to accomplish, you know, ABC. It's like, when you have a kid, man, the thing, you can have your ambitions, but they swallow up so much of your time and mental mind. It's insane. It's, uh, and you know, that, that's what you sign up for. And that's, that's part of it. And you, the, a lot, a lot of that is psychology, right? It's like, and I have to think about it in a way though, where am I, but I mentioned earlier, my mom was a Vietnamese refugee. Uh, my parents both were, so but they had to take care of four kids, and my mom gave away every ambitious she ever had. She didn't even think about it, never thought about it, right? She's never been to the places she wanted to go. She's never carved out, you know, a weekend to watch the Netflix show she wanted to watch, or like these small things to the big ambitions from to the small ones. Never had time for it. So I mean, the sacrifice I make with a kid is so small uh, relative to what I know my parents have done, previous generations have done, other parents of uh, of of my age core are doing already, um, but your larger question was about habits. I think I talked about it earlier. It was just consistency. Uh, I'd be happy to end on this kid point because I actually do, funny enough, have to run and pick up my kid. But uh, yeah, I, I just say if you can accomplish sixty percent of your goals of that day while trying to manage a little one, that's a that's a W. That's a, that's all I'd say. Yeah, I love it. Um, I, I was actually going to hit on that point. I know we're forty minutes in, and you have to pop off. Um, any other closing thoughts, remarks? Oh, and before you do that, a couple people have asked me. First of all, a lot of people have said this was great. I got some great DMs. So thank you so much for carving out the time. I know you're traveling as well, I'm pretty sure. 
to do this, uh, or well, you have been. We were kind of, you know, figuring. Yeah, we're doing a little bit back and forth. Yeah, uh, yeah. For people that want the recording, one Twitter does record it. However, I thought this was an awesome space. I knew it was going to be great. Um, two fantastic, you know, panelists up here, and then my co-host. So I did have someone come in and screen record it. We're going to put that onto YouTube and Spotify. And for anyone that wants to find those, they're just in link in my bio. You can go. It's called the Market Madness Podcast on Spotify, the Market Madness, uh, Wolf Financial on YouTube, and it'll be recorded and everybody can listen to it there. But Trung, uh, this was awesome. Any other closing remarks, thoughts, advice for the audience? Uh, no, thank you. Uh, thank you for the time. Uh, I do appreciate when people jump on spaces. I don't do a lot of these, but I know how hard uh, uh, to synchronize uh, time already is. So if people take some time out of their day, you know, really appreciate that. And uh, thank you for setting it up. Uh, thank you for uh, the last 40 minutes. My pleasure. My pleasure. Good luck with the fam. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Sean. Awesome. Brennan, uh, I think we'll probably just go to you and do the same. You know, any other closing thoughts, remarks, and then Stock Market News. Uh, actually, before we go to Brennan, Stock Market News, any other questions uh, for Brennan before we do that? Honestly, Brennan, I'd love to want to throw one of the questions that I threw at Chung at you. Is like, what gets you excited about Twitter? Like, there's a lot of things, like seeing a post go viral, getting a big follower, everything's exciting, but like, what is that level of success for, success for you? Is it, you know, touching a, a new person? Is it reaching a, that was a, what was another right? Is it reaching a new person? Careful there. Really being able to make a difference? Is it, you know, getting that big connection that, that you're able to, you know, get in there and do some stuff? Or is it that viral post that really gets you going? Yeah, I actually don't, I mean, I don't really care for a viral. I mean, obviously you all, we all want to grow on Twitter and social media and stuff. But like, I think the thing that lights me up is when I actually see somebody like say oh my god i didn't know that like that that can actually be applied to my situation and now i can better my life as a result or a lot of times my dms like i i answer every dm i have for those that don't know i'm i'm actually bigger on instagram that's my bigger following um and so twitter's kind of my secondary but twitter is more of my like natural state per se like like twitter like my tweets just come to me most times i don't have to like think through them and like really um put a lot of time but if you go to if you go to instagram and you, you watch me put together a reel it might take six hours to put together but my twitter like it's just natural flowing and so i love when i i put something out and i get a dm and say you know they'll, they might ask me a question or just say thank you like those small comments mean a lot um so that really is what lights me up like sure if a post goes viral and you know it's it, typically it's not gonna i feel like every time you put together a thread like typically those threads are like throttled by twitter the algorithm so like some of the stuff like the my best work per, like that I think's the best work doesn't really get out there unfortunately just because of the algorithm. So um, yeah, the biggest thing for me is just actually having an impact. I like to say uh, impact's greater than income, and if I can see that actively working in my day, it's a success for me. Yeah, first of all, I just want to completely agree with that. Like, Oh, a lot of the posts, there's certain things that you can do that you know will go off, but it's not necessarily top level content. There's that little in between spot where you pull back a little, like, and really get the quality over quantity. So, definitely agree with that. It's a little tough to know, like, what is the best thing here. So, I, I definitely totally agree with your answer. And actually, just checked out your Instagram. So, uh, so love that. Big shout out to you and uh, back to you, Wolf. Yeah, man. I think that was a, was a great answer there, Brennan. Um, I would also like to just give one other question here. So, you know, you recently took that leap, left the job, and obviously it, you know, paid off a lot for you. Uh, during that transition, I'm sure there were things that went right, went wrong. What are some of the things that you would have done differently? And maybe you would advise somebody else that is trying to make that move from a nine to five into their own, uh, being their own boss? Yeah, I'm going to answer this question a little differently. So, not necessarily what did I do different um, or what would I have done differently. I think I did everything the way I would, I would do it again, to be honest. Um, now, the mindset with going from a nine to five paycheck to a totally self-employed paycheck is a massive hurdle. Um, and some, for some people that have, you know, I, my depends where your risk tolerance is, right? So like where I am emotionally and, you know, where I am on a daily basis from a risk perspective, like, it was a big shock to me. And I didn't know until I actually stopped receiving that paycheck or that dopamine hit from Deloitte. And so like during this, you know, part of this time I was kind of getting both. So it was like, okay, this is awesome. Um, I'm doing uh, my own business and I'm getting paid for my nine to five job. Like there's nothing better than that. And then you're like, 
well, I can, you know, I've out earned my nine to five and I felt comfortable leaving for 12 straight months was kind of my goal is that once I do that, I'm definitely leaving. We paid off our house in that week. I quit my job at the same, the same time. And so I was on fire. And I think I, for any of you guys on my email list, I openly told you about how I was feeling mentally, like breaking, peeling back the onion and being very truthful with everybody. And it was a struggle. And, and I openly get, went into detail. So if you're on my email list, you saw that. Um, and I think that's still with me somewhat today. And I'm trying to cope with it and be, and be real with myself and say, you know what, this is this entrepreneur's life. You know, it's, it's certainly not for everybody. Um, first and foremost, but secondly is like, you're going to have to be willing to fight through that if you really want what you want. And, and I know I do. So I know I'm, it's something I will fight through, but it's not something that comes natural to me. Like I said, I always grew up thinking I was going to college and get a nice paycheck from a nice job. And I was doing that for six years and boom, this, you know, budge dog and everything came about. And it was like, wow, this is a huge, huge shift. Like psychologically, it's just a different, different thing. Um, and so you have to be willing to accept like massive change. Be you almost kind of, you know, things are going to change. You don't know what's going to change when and when things are going to be up and down, but you have to be willing to embrace constant, you know, turning directions and, and changing things that are going on and, and, becoming adapt, you know, you have to adapt, um, to different situations. And that's hard, um, from a psychological standpoint, as you're working through entrepreneurship, you know, like maybe one month you have a tremendous month, the next month is, is, is great. And you feel like business is trending down when in reality, it might be an algorithm thing, or it might be some external factor that you can't really control. You have to be able to control your mind. And I think ever since I went self-employed, I've learned more about myself in the last six, seven months than I have in the last 29 years. And I think it's something extremely powerful. And I think I'm on, on the, on the brink of something great. Um, and I have full confidence in that, but it's, it's been remarkable of, of what I've felt, um, in that change and shift, uh, over the last couple of months. Very cool. Very cool. Well, that's awesome, man. Um, this was this was really cool. Uh, we ran 50 minutes. Hopefully, everybody's pulled some stuff out from this. Um, re, you know, not so recently, I guess, but recently also made the change. You know, being uh, the boss uh, or your own boss, right? Which kind of means that you have to give yourself a lot of tasks, <laughs> uh, similar similar to yourself. And it's been quite the uh, quite the time to be alive. Your eyes hurt a lot of the days, and they get longer and longer. But um, certainly, are seeing the benefits in the perks. Any other closing remarks, advice, or thoughts you'd like to share today? Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for being here. I appreciate every, each and every one of you guys. If you guys ever need to reach out, ask for financial help, just have a question, my DMs are wide open. I answer every DM, so feel free. Don't, you know, don't be shy. Um, also, make sure you guys are all following me on all, all the other socials. I'm growing out, like my Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, different types of forms of content and stuff that I'm trying to really get out there outside of Twitter with um, just the style of posting and stuff like that. So I'm always here to help you guys. Just let me know. Awesome. Thank you, Brandon. Yeah. Make sure to check out Brandon on all of his others. I'm sure you can find links in his bio. Evan, anything else you want to say today? Just a huge shout out to uh, Brandon and Shrug. For, sorry, for coming out and making such a fantastic spaces. Big shout out to Wolf for bringing us all together. Shout out to Gob, uh, the account that's also up here, the man behind the Wolf account. And make sure you're checking them out and give them all a follow. I'm guarding on all those other platforms too. Twitter is still the home, but uh, we're out here spanning the tentacles. So uh, big shout out to that. Big shout out to Wolf. One more, more time. Make sure you're following Brandon, Wolf. Trung, I know he had to stop off or, or hop off, and you're probably already following him. But yeah, big shout out to all that, and excited for more of the, the, all the other space we have for that. Love it. Love it. Awesome, man. Well, this was great. Uh, we have our next space in an hour and eight minutes. For anyone that is interested, that is going to be stock, crypto, and NFT pitching. So all the assets that we are mainly looking at on a daily basis, asset pitching with Asset Dash. Come and join. We have Stephen Wealthy, Luke360, Shane Cultra, and Jim Osmond from the Edge C Group joining us and pitching tonight. So it should be a great one. Uh, with that being said, I just pinned up top that link. So if anyone wants to check it out, you can set a reminder. It's also on my page. So you can visit it there. And that's going to do it for today. Everybody, good luck. Get some dinner in. And hopefully we'll see you on the next base. Hope you enjoyed it. I'll try to get uh, these speakers back on soon. I know we'll have Brendan on Friday.
Take care, everybody.